Videos like these are made possible by viewers like you, who support the channel through Patreon, channel memberships, and stream donations. And don't forget to check out the Bad Weapon Rehabilitation servers at www.badweaponrehab.tf. Check the links in the description for more information, and let's get into the video. When it comes to the TF2 workshop, there's always that one hope lingering at the back of your mind. That maybe, just maybe one day, your submitted item will actually make it into the game and forever be immortalized as a part of one of the best multiplayer games ever made. Even if the only content that gets added to the game lately is workshop content, there's still a lot of prestige behind that. And of the thousands of submissions made, only a few dozen get the chance to make it into the game each year. But what if you don't want to make complex animations with taunts or unusual effects, or learn how to sculpt cosmetics in Blender? Well then my friend, war paints are for you. Only being comprised of a series of textures, war paints are without question the simplest thing you can submit to the workshop. But that doesn't mean they're easy to make, and it's certainly not easy to make good ones. I'm now speaking from experience as I have now created and submitted five, well technically six, war paints to the workshop. And I'm going to show you how I did it, how to get the best results, and everything I know about the process so that if you decide to make your own war paints, they'll be the highest quality possible. Let's get started. You'll need a few things to get started, and thankfully none of what you need will cost you any money, and it'll all be linked in the description below. You'll need to download a program called GCFscape, another program called VTF Edit, and an image editing software like GIMP or Photoshop. I'm using Photoshop, which is free for me because it's always morally justifiable to pirate Adobe products. Although I'm not legally allowed to link that one in the description. First things first, open GCFscape. Then, you need to use it to open a file in your Steam library folder. For most people, this will be on your C drive in the Program x86 folder, but I have TF2 installed on my external hard drive, so just keep wherever you have the game downloaded in mind. Once you're in the right place, go to Steam Library, Steam Apps, Common, Team Fortress 2, TF, and look for a file called TF2 underscore textures underscore dir dot vpk and open it up. This is the texture directory for the game and houses pretty much all of the textures you could possibly ask for. But what we're looking for right now is going to be found under the materials folder in another folder called patterns. This is where you'll find the textures for every war paint and decorated weapon in the game. Now the thing you have to know about war paints is you have to use an existing war paint as a base for your own. And not every war paint will come with the features you want. Not every war paint has an albedo tint, custom wear, orientation locking, stickers, custom blood, exposed metal, or any combination of these, especially with team colors. In fact, most of them don't have any of these at all. Hell, some of them are literally just two textures and that's it. My personal favorite war paint to use as a base is Necromanced, because it has most of these traits, with team colors, albedo tint, custom wear, and a sticker. Business Class is also in the same boat here, and Sacred Slayer offers pretty much the same things just without team colors. If you want custom blood, you pretty much have to go with Manana Peeled or Pina Polished, and those don't have team colors, meaning you'll have to submit the team colors as two separate files and hope that Valve is willing to put in the extra work to add it. But even then, I'm personally just not a fan of the mapping of these two textures in particular. I have an irrational hatred of skins where the barrel of the shotgun is the same texture as the pump. Same goes for the grip on the scattergun being the same texture as the barrels. For orientation lock textures, Park Pigmented, Helldriver, and Sunriser are great options for this. Park Pigmented for the extra stickers, Helldriver for more basic non-team colored patterns, and Sunriser for with team colors. Also, both Helldriver and Sunriser will come with albedo tinting. Orientation locking pretty much just means that certain textures on war paints like Helldriver will always point in a specific direction. In this case, the flames point towards the back of the weapon. This is very useful for certain types of war paints like the hot rod flames on the examples given, or for certain war paints with stripe textures but it's not necessary for more simple war paints that don't use these kinds of textures. If all you have are flat colors, 
then you really don't need orientation locking. It's ultimately down to the concept of your particular warpaint and how you want to best go about it. One more thing that I'll mention is gradients, but I wouldn't recommend going too crazy with warpaints that have this as a base. Macaw Masked, Tiger Striped, and Leopard Printed all have gradients that change the color of your warpaint based on the colors you choose in the gradient. Basically, it takes a little chunk out of the gradient you made and applies that to the color of the assigned war paint texture. The gradient itself is simple enough to create. There is a gradient tool right there for you in Photoshop, although there are some dud files that don't actually do anything which you don't need to worry about or include in your war paint base. But that's not really the problem here. The real problem is that it's incredibly difficult to actually create a good looking war paint with this base, and it's very easy to screw up. My advice would be to start off with something much simpler to get a feel for what you're doing, and decide whether or not you even like making war paints before using a more advanced base like these ones. Always remember that it's never too late to go back to Blender. In any case, I'll be linking a couple of guides in the description that cover all of the war paints currently in the game. These guides list every war paint's special conditions, like custom wares, team colors, and orientation locking, and all of the files you need to download from GCFscape in order to properly edit them all. This is a very helpful resource that will give you an idea of exactly what you're working with before you even get started, which it's about time we do. Once you've picked your war paint base, it's time to actually get editing. For my example, I'll be using Necromance just so I can show you as much as I can with a single war paint. So in GCFscape, that'll be under Patterns, Workshop, Scream Fortress 2021, and this file right here, 257606, 0529. You'll want to keep these file names in mind so you can test out the war paint in game, which you're going to need to do just to see how it looks, take screenshots for your workshop submission, and make sure everything works properly. To do this, go back to your Steam library folder, just normally, not in GCFscape, and navigate your way to the TF folder like so, same way you did before. Then go into your custom folder. If you don't have a custom folder, not a problem, just make a new folder right here in TF and name it custom. Make a new folder inside of your custom folder and name it whatever you want. This doesn't matter. For my purposes, I'll be calling this folder War Paint Testing since that's what we're using it for. Then, just recreate the file path for the war paint you chose inside of this new folder. So in our case, we're gonna start off creating materials, then patterns, workshop, then Screen Fortress 2021, and then 257-606-0529. Make sure the file order and the exact name of all the files is the same as for the war paint base you used, otherwise it won't work. This last folder here is where you'll insert the VTF files that make up your war paint. And speaking of which, it's about time we extract those VTF files from GCFscape and put them somewhere we can keep track of them. I would personally keep a folder for each individual war paint you create, and inside of that folder, have more folders for each individual draft of your war paint. The reality is, you're not going to get it right on your first try. I certainly didn't. This was my first attempt at my first war paint, Dazzle Decorated. I knew I wanted to go for some kind of camo-like pattern, but I had zero experience in that and basically used this as an opportunity to try and get the colors where I wanted them. So that way, once I remade the main texture, I'd be good to go. If you have drafts, you can go ahead and experiment as much as you like, and if you go too far or lose sight of what you were making, then you can start again from an earlier version, or use a texture from a previous draft that maybe you ended up changing a bit too much along the way. Something else important to realize is sometimes, a concept may just not work out at all. For example, this was my first attempt at my second war paint, Triassic Tinted. I initially based it off the Jurassic Park Ford Explorers, before deciding this texture was too loud, too bright, and too busy, and settled on basing it off of the Jurassic Park Jeeps instead, which looked much better while still staying true to the reference I wanted to make. It also gave me the opportunity to use a new base which allowed for the sticker element, so I gained something out of the failed attempt. You will fail at this a few times, and that's okay, this isn't an easy thing to get right, especially when you're just starting out. It's like I said, War paints are the simplest items on the workshop to create, but that doesn't make them easy. In any case, let's get to the interesting part, 
actually creating the textures for our war paint. I'll pretty much be doing a do-over of my Dazzle Decorated Mark II war paint. The Mark I was... Wow! Okay. Controversial, to say the least. Like I said, you're gonna fail this a few times and that's okay. So let's start with our base colors. I use colors straight from the source. Actual navy ships with dazzle camouflage, since that's the theme of the war paint. Naturally, this will change with the theme of your own war paint, but military colors generally fit well into TF2's color palette, so they're a good start. Just look at the Warbird case. And then shed a tear as you realize we will never get anything as awesome looking as the Red Bear shotgun in the game ever again. Colors are a very tricky thing to get right. Even a few shades of saturation can make all the difference from something being too bright to just right. You're going to want to experiment with this a lot during the creation process, and try to avoid using anything too saturated. Use the game itself for inspiration. Try and pick colors that you might see in game, and by looking around, you might even get a good concept based around something in-game. That's what Bomb Carrier did by basing itself off the textures and patterns of the tanks in MVM, and that's what I did for Triassic Tinted by partly theming it around the map enclosure. Anyway, it's very important that your texture is able to loop seamlessly on your war paint, so you don't end up with a geometrical team situation. As much as I love that war paint, the seams on its main texture are a real mark against it. So let's make our initial textures here. Just some basic geometrical patterns. Each pattern on its own separate layer, and this is important for multiple reasons. We want to keep them in their separate layers and not merge them quite yet. Later on, we're going to change the color of these textures over to the opposing team's side, but right now, we're going to offset them. Simply go to the Filters tab up here in Photoshop, then go to Other and Offset. This will move the layer around by the selected amount of pixels, so you can use this to see if there are any seams around the edges of your design and then fix those with the healing brush if need be, or you can use the offset tool to move them into a proper position without damaging the texture you made in the first place. Now for the texture work itself. These shapes are a good start, but they need extra touches. So I used the smudge and blur tool to add some scuff marks onto the paint to make it look more naturally painted on. And I add a layer underneath each shape outlining it with a more messy spongy looking brush Again, to help with it looking more natural. I know it'll be tempting to want to stick with super clean and perfect designs, but imperfections make the war paint look a lot more natural and a lot less lazy. This sort of thing is really tedious and will take you a while on a war paint like this, and if you're not willing to put that kind of work in, then making war paints may not be for you. There is no easy way to get a high quality item on the workshop. You have to work for it, and when you do, people will appreciate you for it. And now once all that's done, we're not quite finished yet, because we still have the alpha channel to be concerned about. This is one of the most important aspects of your war paint, as it'll indicate how much it shines in the light and in what pattern. Whatever is lighter on the alpha channel will end up being the shiniest, especially if your war paint has an albedo tint, which just gives it this overall shiny effect. Leaving the alpha channel pure white means it'll be all shine, all the time, which might not be what you're looking for, and all black will mean it won't have any shine at all. For some textures, you can simply copy and paste your main texture into the alpha channel, which will automatically turn it grayscale, and then adjust the levels to your liking so that the lighter elements will remain shiny. For my war paint, I decided to go for a brushed metal texture, which was fairly easy to do. Just run over it a few times with one of Photoshop's default brushes to give it some thin lines running across the war paint, and maybe use a blur filter to make it look more natural. This adds a nice bit of texture to the weapon model and makes it look just that bit more dimensional. And speaking of texture, we're not quite done with this one yet. See, even if you don't want to go for more complex patterns and just want flat colors, that doesn't mean you want flat textures. TF2 has a very specific art style when it comes to things like paint and metal. A certain way that things are painted onto the textures is very distinctive. Now luckily, there's this set of TF2 paint texture Photoshop brushes for download on Game Banana that I am absolutely in love with. They simplify and streamline the process of making your own texture overlays. These will give your texture that nice classic painted TF2 look. Simply take your grayscale overlay, put it over your main texture, apply the overlay effect to it, and adjust the transparency as needed. Couldn't be simpler. You can use the brushes to create your own overlays, but I'll also be including one that I made myself with these brushes, linked in the description for you to use as freely as you want. You don't even have to credit me if you use it for your own war paints. But trust me, making your own is simple, 
satisfying, and anyone can do it. These will do wonders for your war paint's feel. After that, it's a simple matter of doing the same thing again for the opposing team with our main texture. For that, I simply save the red team version as its own file, then use the color overlay function to directly change the color of each layer into something more befitting of the blue team, and then I save that as its own file. My recommendation is to save a PSD file for each team color at the point where you still have the layers intact, so that way you can tweak each individual color if you need to. This is why you wanted to keep your layers separated earlier, because if you didn't, then now you have to use the color correction tool or some other crap over the entire texture instead of each color individually, and that's not always going to look very good unless you just have a flat color as your texture. This is pretty much what happened to the Health and Hell war paint, and it's the reason that the blue version looks a lot better than the red version. The blue version was based on actual colors used in the game for the Halloween boss health bars, while the red version was simply color corrected into being red. We don't talk about health and hell green. So with all of that, with your war paint conceptualized, your texture painted, your overlays applied, and your alpha channels ready to go, you finally have one texture done. Congratulations. Now do that two or three more times. Okay, you shouldn't really go through that whole process two or three more times. It's a good rule of thumb to have one busy texture per war paint and have the rest be more simplistic. This was the mistake I made with Dazzle Decorated Mark 1. I made two busy textures that clashed together and detracted from the quality of the war paint. It was a learning process. I replaced that texture with a somewhat detailed but still simplified sheet metal texture, and my tertiary texture was a simple black on both versions. Neither of these required any artistic knowledge or special tools. I made them all with just my mouse and Photoshop. For the sheet metal, I took a gray background and copied the individual sheets over it as their own layers, and used Photoshop's emboss and stroke tools on each layer to give them their own edge along with a very subtle orange-brown inner glow to give it a sort of oxidized appearance. Then, I copied the same circle over and over again in straight lines across the sheets, and another emboss and a drop shadow to really sell them as rivets. Then I slapped on a metal texture overlay, and just like that, it's good to go. And the black was just a simple flat texture with another metal overlay, but it's important when using black and white to never use pure black or pure white always go for a more off color. The same rule about saturation applies not just to bright colors, but also to the neutral blacks and whites that you'll be using to balance out your war paint. Harshly saturated blacks and whites do not look good on TF2 weapons, so it's best to avoid them altogether and mute them into light and dark grays. Even on Dazzle Decorated Mark 1, I didn't go for pure black and white for the Dazzle pattern, and I ended up muting both colors. Now, with that, we have our main three textures for the war paint done. In this state, assuming your war paint base only has the main two or three textures in it, this tutorial is done for you. But if you want to use all that Necromance has to offer, you have these other files to consider. We'll start with this file here. Don't let the albedo name confuse you. This doesn't affect the shine of your war paint. This is your custom wear. Basically, this is the texture under your war paint. This is a highly desirable trait to have on your war paint, as on many weapons like the pistol, it can absolutely save it at wares beyond just factory new. A lot of people like to use the custom wear as a sort of gimmick, like Ghoul Blaster giving guns with higher wear a nice coating of Nickelodeon slime, or Mechanized Monster having scorch marks on lower wares, but I generally prefer using it to complement the colors that your war paint already has in the same way that Sacred Slayer does. So I went with an inoffensive, sort of dark gray. You don't have to worry too much about anything fancy. This is the same as editing any other texture, but if the name confused you, now you know what it does. Next up are the two metal gradient textures. These ones might end up confusing you because they're a lot smaller than the other textures, and if you've seen the Necromance war paint before, you might not recognize them right away. But they're nothing to be concerned over. These gradient textures will go over your metal base texture, in my case the sheet metal, and you can use them to give that texture a nice looking gradient that's also team colored. I use this function in Triassic Tinted to basically swap around which textures would be the team colored textures and which ones would be the more neutral ones since I wanted the neutral gray to take up the majority of the war paint just like the gray paint takes with the majority of the jeeps in the movie. 
just another reason why I like Necromance so much as a base. It's extremely versatile. So basically, just put whatever gradient fits your particular war paint. You can give it a very slight tinting to more easily differentiate between different teams, use it as the main team color like I did for Triassic Tinted, or simply leave it a neutral color like I did for Dazzle Decorated, letting it simply act as a gray gradient on my sheet metal texture. And finally, with all of that out of the way, we have the sticker. This element will be plastered on most of your weapons with a handful of exceptions, and it can be a somewhat hit or miss element. Not every war paint necessarily benefits from a sticker, but those with a certain theme could absolutely use this orientation locked element. So use it at your own discretion. With Dazzle Decorated being based on navy ships, it felt fitting to give it a navy ship hull number, and I went with 07 for the year TF2 was released. This is one element you may need to draw yourself, or get someone else to draw for you. I ended up doing my own logo for my Warpaint Soaring Eagle, but for Triassic Tinted, I had to reach out to the creator of Enclosure in order to get the logo used around the map that I used for the sticker. Err on the side of giving credit where it's due, and don't be afraid to ask people for the art assets that you don't feel comfortable in being able to make yourself. Don't forget the alpha channels on the sticker, this is extremely important. Anything black on the alpha channel will be completely invisible on the sticker element, and anything grey will become slightly transparent. This generally looks like ass, so make sure your entire sticker element is white in the alpha channel. Necromanced has two stickers, one for the left and one for the right, but I've pretty much always seen them as being the same texture used twice over, one on the left side of the weapon and one on the right side, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel with this one. Now, with all of that out of the way, your textures are done. Hopefully you still have your PSD versions with all the layers intact where needed, and now it's time to save the file again as a Targa file with all of the channels, including the alpha channel selected so that it'll import the alpha channel's effects. You'll get this red overlay once you do this. Don't worry, it won't show up on the warp paint, that just means you're doing it right. You need to save it as a Targa if you're going to import it to VTF Edit the final program you need. This is a pretty simple process for most textures. Just import the Targa files you saved and save them as VTF files with the exact same name as the file you're replacing on the war paint. Then you simply place the file in that 257-606-0529 folder we made way back when and your texture should be imported onto the war paint of your choice. But this gets complicated with stickers. And by complicated, I mean you have to click a few checkboxes. So on the left hand side of VTF edit, you'll see a bunch of flags with checkboxes next to them. For the most part, you don't really want to mess with these. But for your sticker element specifically, you always, always want to check off everything starting with clamp. So clamp S, clamp T, clamp U, and clamp all. Think of this as clamping the sticker to the proper spot, because if you don't do this, the war paint will look like this. You don't want it to look like this. And just like that, you've successfully made a war paint. Now you just have to put all of the VTF files into a zip folder and upload it to the workshop through TF2 with this little wrench icon right down here. Just follow the instructions from here and don't be surprised if it takes a little while for your tax information to get filled out. It took a couple of weeks for me. Now, if your war paint doesn't look to your liking right away, don't feel bad and don't get discouraged. Making Dazzle Decorated was not as simple a process as this video made it out to be. In fact, it went through about 10 drafts before I was finally finished with it. Triassic Tinted similarly went through about 5 drafts. And while I didn't save too many drafts of Vivid Varnish, trust me when I say that getting all the wood colors and the gradient to my liking was not an easy feat and I agonized over it. It's all about finding out which war paint base best suits your particular vision, what colors you use, and how the textures fit with one another. You will make duds, whether it's initial attempts at a concept that you'll eventually just get right, or a concept that's just straight up dead in the water. I have three war paint designs that I've just flat out scrapped entirely. You're not going to get this perfectly on your first try, and even your submissions that you think are ready will likely receive criticism. It's important to use the criticism you get on your war paints in order to make them as good as possible. Dazzle Decorated probably would have remained busy as shit if it wasn't for an absolute swath of negative feedback I got on it. 
and now it's generally much more liked. Now, not all of the workshop feedback is going to be helpful. Plenty of people are just dicks about it. Some people have genuinely no idea what they're talking about, and the positive and negative rating system may not tell you exactly what people dislike about your war paint without comments to accompany it. Sometimes you'll upload a war paint that you think is a slam dunk only for it to get middling workshop reviews despite the fact that there are zero negative comments and it makes you wonder what the fuck you could possibly even fix because obviously you think it looks good, otherwise you wouldn't have fucking uploaded it, or at least god I hope that's the case. And yeah, it really sucks to waste a lot of your time on something that doesn't work out, but if you just work hard at it and continue to improve, then the results will speak for themselves, and you may just finally get that coveted self-made in the game. This has all been a huge learning experience for me in just how war paints are made, what to avoid when creating them, and how to handle what's been a somewhat controversial aspect of the workshop, which is harsh critique including from one of its most controversial harsh critiquers on multiple occasions. I have a newfound appreciation for the people who can make truly amazing war paints, knowing just how much effort and trial and error goes into this process, and I have just as much hope for my contemporaries to get their skins in the game as I do for my own. And hopefully, with the help of this video, that list of people can include you. Let's strive to make the next war paint case even better than Summer 2023's. Thanks for watching, and good luck on creating out there.